Excuse me, everyone. Sex! Now that I have your attention. Hey, and welcome to The Office Field Guide. My name's Chris, and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever, and today, we're talking about sex ed. You need to contact every woman you've been with and notify them of your herpes infestation. It's the right thing to do. The Office goes full on ghost of girlfriends past, and he puts on one of those seminars we needed our parents' signature to go to. Uh, I, I will now show you how to put this condom on <laughs> using <laughs> this pencil. And... Can we please talk about how gross Meredith is? All that and more in today's episode, so let's get into it. And more than normal, spoilers ahead. I understand nothing. Okay, I don't tend to spend a lot of time on really lowly rated episodes of The Office as I don't think these videos are really gonna bring all the boys to the yard. And hopefully that's not the case here though, as I think there's something really genius about this. At least I think there's something genius about what this episode's attempting to pull off. I've always enjoyed the premise of this one. In reality, there probably are some things left to be desired, but we're gonna get more into that later. Sex Ed's main plot line surrounds Michael's quest at the behest of Dwight to inform all of his past lovers of his possible STD. It's a pimple, Phyllis. Avril Lavigne gets them all the time and she rocks harder than anyone alive. Uh, that's no pimple, Michael. You mean cancer? I have a cold sore. I didn't even have a cold. I don't know how I got it. I know how you got it. How? Michael, come on. A cold sore is herpes. And cold sores are really common. They're these tiny little blisters that are in fact caused by the herpes simplex virus. What? Herpes duplex. There's HSV-1, which usually causes cold sores, and then there's HSV-2. From what I can tell, you can get HSV-1 by interacting with someone who's been infected with HSV-1 or HSV-2. It's also possible to pick up the virus from surfaces, as it's known to hang out on dry inanimate objects for a number of hours. So, I know, the whole toilet seat thing is a myth. HSV is relatively unpleasant, but typically not dangerous. And like most viral infections, there is no cure per se. There's just treatments for HSV. I have a disease for which there is no known cure that has been sexually transmitted to me. Most of those revolve around antiviral medications. So there you go, the more you know. I hope it's worth all of the ads I'm gonna start seeing around the web now. You guys are worth it. So Michael's on this quest. He meets up with most of his exes from throughout the series. But meanwhile, the B-plot has Andy taking the opportunity to put on a Michael-like conference room meeting. Anyone who's interested in entering into an honest discussion about the sexual mores and taboos of modern society will be rewarded with a pizza break. More on that later though, in reality what Andy's doing is awkwardly dealing with Aaron and Gabe still being together. And nobody cares. Nothing would make me happier than to hand you the hand of the hand once in my hand. I specifically remembered it because you said it in such a weird way. And the word on the street is that originally there was a tertiary plot line depicting the camera crew trying to figure out why Jim and Pam had a fight. I couldn't find a lot on this plot line while I was researching for this episode, so take it with a grain of salt, though it might be why Daryl is in between them during the meeting, and also maybe why this sequence with Andy feels so disjointed. So you will win this in the end. It's all about heart and character. Be your best self. Okay. Yeah. I have no idea what his problem is. This is my standard advice. As in maybe he was also consoling Jim and Pam. I don't really know, I'm just making that up. At any rate, this episode has two goals. One is to put Andy as the cringe leader role in the office, but the primary goal is to take that journey with Michael in order to find a pattern in his relationships. Both of these plot lines heavily rely on callbacks to reinforce their themes and messages. Some of those are simple in-universe callbacks, like Jim and Pam's pregnancy. Hey, Whoa. hey, hey, our baby was not a mistake. She was a surprise. Michael's apprehension to GPS. A machine told me to drive into a lake, and I did it. Why do you think I... Left! Willow now! All right! God! Andy's pre-existing love for making announcements. You're always asking for our attention. No, maybe like a year ago. Mm, seems recent. Excuse me. Okay, link, clink, 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 everybody. Andy's newfound love for soccer. I hate soccer. But guess who doesn't hate soccer? 
Charles Minor. That's uh, right. That's what I was thinking. You kept announcing scores. It's the world's only international sports. And a different use for fake mustaches. There are many reasons a man would wear a fake mustache to work. He is a fan of the outrageous. He loves to surprise. I think I cut my penis on the lid. Some callbacks might actually be mistakes, like there's this exchange with Creed and Meredith. I've never seen a herpes on you. Because it's on my genitals, genius. You have a penis? Hey, why haven't we ever... Uh... We have. And then while Michael's talking with Carol... You proposed to me on our fourth date. I get it. You're not ready. We'll wait. This is our doesn't... ninth date, Michael. Well, yeah, but I... It's possible that these were intentionally written to show that humans thinking muscle isn't always the best at recalling details. Uh, something we're going to get to more in the deeper meaning. Really? Well, maybe you should look in the smart part of your brain. Or it's possible the writers just didn't think we'd obsess this much over the series. Works either way. But speaking of the writers, these callbacks are probably here to subliminally invoke as much nostalgia from Michael's past lovers as possible. It's not easy to orchestrate all of this scheduling to pull off an episode like this, so I'm happy it exists in the first place. But again, more on that later. But while we get to hear from a lot of past characters from the show, that's all juxtaposed to the introduction of a new beautiful soul into our cast of characters. Who is this guy by our cars? That is my new maintenance worker, Nate. And you'll be happy to know that he's taking care of that hornet's nest that you've been griping about. Nate is finally here. First time watching the show, I was kind of shocked that Nate became a thing, but I'm really glad he did. He's fun, he's dumb, he's sweet, he's lighthearted. And in my opinion, it's an overall good addition to The Office. I've always appreciated his time on screen. Do you guys think he's right though? Nate Nickerson is portrayed by Mark Prux, an actor, comedian, who, as many of you know, famously got a start in the industry by doing a bit of public stunt pranking. He would take on this character he invented by the name of Kenny Strasser, aka K. Strauss, and began to book appearances on local news stations, claiming to be a yo-yo expert. It'd be clear to everyone that he didn't know what he was doing, and that's what's great about local news. They don't really care, they just wanna fill the void. <gasps> that's what she said? <laughs> Danny Chun, who was uh, kind of the second in command under Paul Lieberstein had become a, a rabid fan of Mark and said, we have to cast this guy. And that's how Nate was born. Mark's first uh, professional acting gig was Nate. He went on to have a few appearances in other shows and became a regular on What We Do in the Shadows, which I hear is pretty good. I've never sat and watched it though. As for the actual appearance in Sex Ed, it's clear why this guy is such a gem. Sweet, sweet, lovable Nate. E before that, La Philadelphia. You speak English? Yes, I'm really good at English. Okay, good, me too. Get in the car. Okay. While there's not a lot of surface with Nate throughout the series, there is a ton of substance in this episode. So let's dive into that in the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. If you're not familiar, Ghost of Girlfriend's Past is a 2009 rom-com starring Matthew McConaughey, Jennifer Gardner, Michael Douglas, and Emma Stone. The film is about a womanizer who's haunted by Ghost of Girlfriend's Past, Present, and Future. The movie is not fantastic, and I believe it's one of the reasons why McConaughey took a little break from acting for, like, a year or two. He kept getting typecast into these rom-coms and was ready to get out. Great story for another time. To say that that film influenced this episode is pretty apparent to me. And while Andy takes lead in the educational aspect of sex ed. I'm gonna show you a picture of genitalia. Oh. oh Andy. Was it because he's black? Nope. It's because it's genitalia. Michael is getting fed a good hard look at his relationships. Jerk. Michael's journey takes him back in time. I mean, a little out of order, I assume, for realism, but he starts with a quick call to Donna, the most recent Scott girl. Hi, Donna, it's Michael. Michael, I didn't think I'd hear from you. Have you been? She seems pretty happy to hear Michael's sultry voice overall. Michael Michaels this call. Oh, no. I can't even say it. H, I, oh my God. R, P, and then the affair's brought up. So you have it, right? No. Does your stupid husband have it? No, he doesn't. Are 
are you telling me I have to get tested? And is it just me or does Dwight feel very season two or season three-esque in this episode? Yes, I am telling you, you have to get tested for herpes. Goodbye. So long, Donna. <laughs> okay. I'll talk to you later, Jan. All right, bye. But I wanted to take a quick look at Michael and Donna's relationship. You're not going to want to put it down. It's going to make you want to go out and buy a Chrysler tomorrow. I own a Chrysler. Shut up. No, you shut up. What's your drink? Grenadine. What? So, when are you coming in for that free lunch? You're going to want to come in on a day that I'm working. feel about breaking up with Donna? Good. Moral. I feel proud. That was not easy because I really liked her a lot. And I absolutely made the right decision. At the end of the day, you have to do what's right. And it was either living with myself or being happy. And I picked the former. Michael's takeaway from Donna is that there is no sense in hanging on to what you can't have, which I think is why he brings up Donna's husband and things quickly escalate. Interestingly though, Michael then moves directly to Holly, the one he just can't give up. No, this is Holly. And this is where the crux of Michael's journey really begins. I don't romanticize. Michael, you cried at that tagline for a movie you made up. He had no arms or legs. He couldn't see, hear, or speak. This is how we led a nation. And just for nostalgia, here's a quick look at Michael and Holly. And I think that we are one of those couples with a long story when people ask how we found each other. Through these blinds is where I first saw you. And you had all these boxes, and I thought you were the prettiest mover I'd ever seen. I talked to her, Holly. <clears throat> it's just pleasantries, I think, you know, not like, do you want kids or religion or what side of the bed do you want? Hey, I can take either side of the bed at this point. Don't do it! Please don't do this! Please don't do this! It's pretty serious, yes. <laughs> Does she ever talk about me? Michael, I've been dating AJ for a year and a half now. She still has feelings for you. She said that? It's not over. And it's going to take a long time. And then it's perfect. I'm in no rush. So plenty of time has passed from when Michael and Holly split up. As in, it feels like a lot of time has passed, but it's only been a couple of years in universe and in our reality. I don't think that this baby would be this old, but I, I'm not a good judge of those kinds of things. Leave it in the comments. Holly tells Michael that he romanticizes things, makes things a bigger deal than what they deserve to be, telling Michael that they only dated for a couple of weeks a few years ago. And while the idea that Michael makes a bigger deal of things than he needs to isn't news to us. I drove my car into a lake. But Holly's words seem to have a pretty profound impact on him. Michael's quest at least internally, shifts from informing us past loves of a potential viral infection, which statistically would have presented itself by now, to instead really figuring out if any of his past relationships had any substance. Which brings us to Jan. How do I do it? Raise my daughter, work as director of office purchasing for this hospital, and release an album of Doris Day covers on my own label? If I knew, I'd tell you. 
So you get the pattern by now. Let's look at Michael and Jan. <laughs> I am really <laughs> thrilled. <laughs> thrilled. <laughs> Imagine there's a princess who falls for a guy beneath her station. I mean, you're obnoxious and rude and 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 stupid, but oh. I still find myself wanting to be with you. Cons. I'm unhappy when I'm with her. Michael, you shouldn't be with someone who doesn't make you happy. We need to talk. I'll tell you this, it is not because of the boob job. Excuse me, boob enhancement. And the queen doesn't like this at all. And the princess knows that the queen doesn't like it and so it makes her want to do it all the more just to get at the queen. Am I the princess? No, I'm the princess and the queen. Okay, so I'm the guy at the station. I love what Jan says in this sequence because while it's really pretentious and unnecessarily cruel to Michael, she's straight up explaining exactly what happened in their relationship. Jan told Michael all of this and back from vacation that she knows she shouldn't be with him. Her therapist suggested that she embraced some of her bad desires and her self-destructive tendencies, so she decided to date Michael. I can't say that's good advice, but she's telling Michael up front that she's in this for her, she expects it to fail spectacularly, and he hears none of it. Jan. You complete me. But now, Michael is primed. He's ready to hear the truth. And it seems like this truth finally gets through to them, that he understands how dysfunctional their relationship really was, not just the breakup. And as Assy walks in, that can't be what people nickname Astrid's, right? Mommy! Assy! Oh. Anyway, as the little one walks in, Karel is putting in the work here. You can read it on his face. I'd call this look distaste. He can't stand this person. Brother. I have herpes. Well, you... And then he pieces out as soon as he can. It's becoming clearer throughout this day that Michael's tendency is to conflate things. I used to think that she was the one. And that's straight up what Helene tells him. Michael, your memory has failed you greatly. After the funny little bit with the older lady. I had to sneak that in there somewhere. And this relationship's a little fresher in our mind. So here's the rundown with Michael and Helene. You, would you have a snack in your purse? <laughs> you know what, I'm gonna start dating her even harder. What's that supposed to mean? You know what it means. So. And I want kids. And you, unfortunately, have already completed that part of your journey down there. And as his journey nears completion, Michael goes to see Carell's real life special lady friend, Carol. They do this cute dance back and forth in which they're nothing but pleasant to one another. But Michael picks just a little bit too far, and Carol tells him the exact same thing he's been hearing all day. Yes, Michael. Actually, you do make a bigger deal out of things than you need to. Well, I believe in love at first sight. Well, so do I, but we didn't love each other at first either. Michael's primary quest is a success. Time to cash it in and get his sweet, sweet loot. Except he never actually told Holly about the potential STD. So after her words have stewed in him all day as he was presented with the ghost of girlfriend's past, it's clear now more than ever in his mind that what he had with Holly was real. And we have this both crushing and beautiful sequence. And I don't know why you downgraded what we had, but I did not make us up. And a fantastic stinger. Okay. Oh, and you might, you should talk to a doctor because you might have herpes. Bye. Season seven of The Office, Michael's dealing with some heavy stuff so far. And it's really cool to watch this character grow finally. Meanwhile, they're just straight dropping the ball massively in The Office. But let's talk about that more in the ratings. Because no one appreciate what I'm doing right now. 
This is the worst. Okay, cold opening. Come on, it's Nate. You know what I'm, you know. No, oh, oh, the no, 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 no. What is he it? doing? Oh, oh they're this. stinging him. No, 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 no. Yep, that's right, five out of five. Dwight's a terrible person, by the way. At 5.45, a certain INS agent by the name of Mose Schrute drops them off in the middle of Harrisburg and tells them it's Canada. As for the episode, here's the thing. I've been excited to tackle this one for a while. I get what they're doing. They're playing the long game here, putting time and energy to get this fantastic character to the point where we're actually happy to see him go. She's perfect for you. She's the one. She's amazing. This is very <laughs> exciting. It's masterclass and I love it. This but you know what? It's just as normal as anyone else's. No. This is not. It doesn't seem to be much of a stretch that coming off the heels of Andy's play, they intended to give Helms this plot line to be the stand-in for Michael. Come on, <laughs> give it a rest, pencil. The problem is it just doesn't land. It feels like they're trying to put Andy in Michael's shoes and that just doesn't work. Helms basically plays a variation of Helms in all of his movies. I've not seen him do theater or anything like that. Maybe he's a, an amazing character actor. I don't know. But in general, he's just this guy. No, she's a part-time frozen yogurt chef. And that guy can be endearing. He can be funny. He can be sincere. He's a massively talented musician. And he can be cringy. I don't have a problem with NBC, the studios, the showrunners, the writers trying to put Helms in the center stage here. He is the biggest name on the show at this point under Carell, who is departing soon. I just can't get behind the approach. As they're simply nailing the execution of this season-long Michael departure plotline, they're totally flubbing all of the hooks for a post-Michael office. Four episodes in, and we haven't had a compelling plotline with Jim or Dwight or Pam. I mean, I guess in fairness, there was a little bit in the last episode, but you know what I mean. Big arcs aside, it's not like the B plot of this is absolute crap. There's cringe, there's a lot of good bits, and vice versa. It feels as though Michael's visit to his former girlfriends, that premise has an incredible setup and should have amazing payoffs. And while I'm a sap for analyzing relational behavior, it feels like this might've been rushed or maybe the opposite, that it was stretched. Getting all these actors scheduling together for an episode could have caused some lackluster comedy to occur. It just feels like something is missing or at least a little bit off. Maybe they had to cram all of this into a single day. Energy was low then and the takes were few. Or maybe they had the opposite problem of having to stretch this out over a few weeks, requiring Carell and Wilson to continually reframe and get back into their characters. Then there's the IMDb scores, which rate this pretty low for an Office episode. Though looking at the written reviews, most of them seem to be really positive. Barring this guy, the title does, this was reasonable, but then says time was used inefficiently, five out of 10. So I don't really know what that means. All up, I still love this episode for the journey it takes us on. I admit that it probably could be better. There is probably the opportunity for much more spectacle and much more potent joke telling. And I don't understand the direction for this B-plot. At no point do I feel that Andy is deserving of any of my attention during this. But maybe that's just me. In spite of all of its shortcomings, I still love this episode. I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5. Everyone, thanks so much for watching. If you like the channel, consider subscribing so you can get notified of new videos. Next week, we're going to be taking a look at The Sting, an episode that I couldn't remember at all whatsoever, so I had to look it up. Danny Cordray, baby. Anyway, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. And thank goodness none of that was true, including the herpes, the ingrown hair. It was probably just an ingrown mustache hair, but we have to be exhaustive. I've already contacted all of my ex-lovers except for you. <laughs>